the Cretaceous and the Tertiary is hidden in a depression running beneath the overhang of a cliff. Until recently, Peter Ward thought that ammonites died out well before the end of the Cretaceous. His latest research is revealing a different story. The gully I'm sitting next to is composed of a clay layer, which is the boundary between the Cretaceous period and the Tertiary period. The rocks I'm sitting on are Cretaceous rocks. The limestones over my head are the first tertiary rocks. Ammonites can be found in relatively common numbers within these rocks, and the last of them are found within inches of the boundary. It seems that the ammonites at the end of the Cretaceous were thriving. They were producing new species, they were flourishing in their communities, and then suddenly, without warning, they disappeared. When the dinosaurs vanished from land, life in the oceans suffered a similar catastrophe. Along with ammonites, whole populations of sea creatures, great and small, also disappeared. But could an asteroid produce such global devastation? This is Meteor Crater, Arizona. Nearly a mile wide, it is the result of the impact of a meteorite a mere 150 feet in diameter. For the Alvarez theory to work, the meteorite that wiped out the dinosaurs had to be 220 times larger. Let us suppose it was. What would its effect have been? Jay Melosh is a theorist who likes to imagine what happens when giant rocks fall out of the sky. This is Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona, and I brought you here to give you a feeling for what the impact of a six mile diameter asteroid will do to the Earth. To get a, an idea of what six miles diameter really means, imagine the space between here and uh, that distant peak on the horizon uh, to be completely filled up with rock material. And further, imagine the space between the valley floor below us and an altitude of six miles filled up with solid rock. This enormous ball of rock will be rushing toward the Earth at 50,000 miles an hour, a speed that, if you were riding it, would take you from here to New York in under three minutes. When the asteroid strikes the ground, it buries itself in the Earth in a period of only one second. It opens a crater, a hemispherical hole in the ground uh, that reaches a diameter of 30 miles about 10 seconds after the impact occurs. That time it's 15 miles deep, it's lined with red hot rock debris streaming outward forming a plume heading into the sky. Um, at that time the crater floor begins to rise back up at the same time the diameter of the crater continues to increase. It goes on until it reaches a diameter of about 100 miles before it stops growing. next is really interesting. As the asteroid plunges into the ground, it creates pressures about equal to that of the Earth's core. Under those pressures, the asteroid and also some of the Earth rock uh, melt and vaporize and expand back out of the crater as a plume or glowing cloud of very high velocity gas and dust. Uh, this cloud expands at velocities up to the Earth's escape velocity, sending the uh, debris into ballistic orbits that eventually rain back all over the Earth. Trillions of tiny particles of this kind fill the sky, radiating heat toward the ground. On the ground, 
you would feel an effect very similar to that of an oven on broil, lasting for about an hour. The even green vegetation would dry out and begin to burst into flame spontaneously as a result of this thermal radiation, causing global forest fires.
we see a central ring of, of high gravity anomalies indicating more dense material here in the center, again about uh, 65 kilometers across, then a gravity low indicating lower density material, and finally another gravity high 180 kilometers in diameter. This area had been interpreted as containing volcanic features, but I had never seen uh, volcanic features with this kind of symmetry on this sort of scale before. And it appeared to me that this had to be the result of a single event uh, that at, at one time froze both the gravity and the magnetic fields in this highly symmetrical, highly ordered uh, arrangement. And uh, the most likely explanation to me was that of a gigantic meteor impact. There was no doubt that Penfield had discovered something. A great circular structure 130 miles across, 2,500 feet beneath the surface of the Yucatan. In his mind's eye, Penfield saw a multi-ringed crater, complete with a raised central region and concentric rings. But where was the physical evidence in the form of actual rocks? We lacked any samples to prove it. We had these excellent geophysical data sets, the magnetic and the gravity data, but not the physical samples which could establish once and for all that this was a gigantic impact feature. In the 1950s, the oil company had drilled exploratory wells in two places in the Yucatan. Samples of rock had been taken from both sites. When to see them, they had all been lost or destroyed. In 1982, refusing to give up, Penfield went to the Yucatan to see if some rock samples had been left at the sites. First, he looked in the village of Sakapuk.
This is the Brazos River in Texas. In 1987, Alan Hildebrand, D student at the University of Arizona, Tucson, had heard about the Alvarez impact theory and was conducting his own search for a likely crater. At the time, he had never heard of Glenn Penfield. Today, the Brazos River here is about 200 miles from the Gulf Coast. 65 million years ago, the late Cretaceous Sea covered this area. Here was about 500 feet deep. Along the banks of this river, we see the fossils of ammonites and other marine creatures that lived along with the dinosaurs and went extinct along with the dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous. Hildebrand knew that hidden in the river banks is one of the world's most unusual Cretaceous tertiary boundary sites. In most places, the Cretaceous and Tertiary rocks are separated by a very narrow clay layer, one that is no more than a half inch thick. But on the bank of this river, there is a rubble-filled interval almost three feet deep. Here, the dividing line between the world of the dinosaurs and the world that came after is startlingly clear. shows the Cretaceous tertiary boundary section. My feet are resting on the Cretaceous sediments. This is mud that was deposited in the sea that was about 500 feet deep. Here is the base of the tertiary. From here upwards we have sediments that represent a time when the dinosaurs were extinct. There's about three feet of sediment in between that indicates something extraordinary happened here. In particular, this lump of gray clay, which is a bit indistinct, see it goes around like so. This is a boulder about three feet across. Something happened that was able to uproot this this gray clay from the Cretaceous seafloor and transport it and dump it here. Similar deposits of rubble like this occur all along the southern coast of North America at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. presence of the rubble beds here and the rubble beds all along the southern coast of North America indicates that something extraordinary happened here, something like a giant wave washing across the southern margin of the continent. We can't imagine how such a giant wave could have formed except for something like an impact in the ocean. Still unaware of Penfield's work in the Yucatan, Hildebrand first suspected that a circular feature on the ocean floor off the coast of Colombia might be the crater. He was looking for the bruise left on the face of the earth by a meteorite blow. Then he heard about another site, this one in Haiti. 65 million years ago, this region, like that around the Brazos River, was beneath the sea. High in the mountains, near the village in Haiti's southern peninsula, there was a curious sequence of marine rock. It was discovered by Florentine Maras, a native-born Haitian, now at Florida International University, Miami. This is my site. That's the Belloc Formation. The bottom two-thirds from the valley is Cretaceous. And above it, that's tertiary. Right about one third from the road, you can see a little quarry, and that's where we have the KT boundary. The KT boundary is what scientists call the layer of rock laid down at the end of the Cretaceous period. At first, Maras thought that he had found traces of an ancient volcano. Not until 15 years later did Alan Hildebrand suggest that, like the Brazos River site, it might indicate the presence of a nearby impact crater. Oh, 
Okay, this is another piece of the bond air layer. As you can see here, it is very, very distinct. At the bottom, that's Cretaceous, and here, that's the boundary, the so-called boundary layer. And we are going to take a sample to show you what it looks like. It was at this point, September 1990, that the dinosaur series itself played a small part in the story. Samples collected for our purposes proved to be of particular interest to both Florentine Maras and geologist Glenn Isette. Here's a sample of the rock that uh, you see here being collected by Florentine Morass and that the dinosaur production team was, was kind enough to uh, bring back from Haiti. Uh, I've mounted the rock sample in, in plastic and then ground it flat so we can see what's going on with this in this rock. What uh, really uh, drew my attention is this zone here in the base of the, of the sample, about two centimeters thick, of greenish black pellets. Seen under the microscope, the pellets had a curious and distinctive shape. They resembled tektites, droplets of molten material splashed out of the earth by an impact and then frozen into form. A drop of milk falling into a bowl creates the same forms as it splashes into the liquid beneath. Tektites in the boundary layer would prove that an asteroid impact occurred at the end of the Cretaceous period. Izet took a closer look at the interior of the molten pellets. It turns out to be a black glass, real tectite glass. It demonstrates that there really was an impact at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. Tectites uh, have only been found uh, associated with uh, large asteroid or comet impacts. Meanwhile, Alan Hildebrand was still scouring the scientific literature, looking for word on circular features that would prove an impact once occurred. Finally, he came across Penfield's article on the Yucatan Crater. In it, Penfield mentioned the lost samples of rock. But where were they? Hildebrand persisted in his search. I wrote people, I called people, I talked to dozens of different people, and finally, with the help of colleagues, we got lucky, and I found that a set of samples had been sitting in New Orleans for the last 20 years. In April 1990, Hildebrand passed the information along to Glenn Penfield, and Penfield paid a visit to the geology department at the University of New Orleans. After 12 years, his quest was almost over. of samples produced as the drill chewed its way through 10,000 feet of the Earth's crust. They all looked pretty much alike, except for one. This one here, from uh, 301 to 303 meters, is unlike any of the others. Green, full of fragmented uh, shards of broken up rocks that existed previously. Uh, it has a, a texture totally unlike any of the other samples of the limestone throughout the well. Uh, and it uh, signifies a rock uh, put together of, uh, of fragments of, of pre-existing rock, um, disordered and jumbled together and broken up. Penfield sent a sample to Alan Hildebrand to look for the key features that would signify the impact of a comet or asteroid, iridium or shocked quartz. When Glenn Penfield sent me the first samples we'd found in New Orleans, we did a couple of separations of them, and we found some shock quartz in both of the samples. And of course,
course, with the, the duplication and the care we take in making these perforations, we were quite sure that we'd established that shock quartz occurred in this deposit outside but near the crater. And so likely the, the big hole nearby was a crater. Millions of years ago, something happened here. A titanic explosion that sent shock waves hundreds of miles in every direction, carrying debris at least as far as the coast of Texas. We're sitting here at ground zero in the Chicxulub crater. It stretches for 90 kilometers in every direction around us and represents one of the most cataclysmatic events in the Earth's history. We named it Chicxulub both for the village nearby here and for the first well that was drilled into the structure, uh, but also appropriately because Chicxulub in the ancient like means the tale of the devil. The Yucatan crater is in the right place and it's the right size. But is it the right answer? Perhaps the dinosaurs were already going extinct. Scientists know that 61 kinds of dinosaur were alive six million years before the end of the Cretaceous. But two million years before the end of the Cretaceous, there were only 18. Recently, new evidence has come to light that something did indeed hit the Earth in the late Cretaceous period. Most paleontologists are reluctant to accept the idea that this event could have extinguished the dinosaurs. Okay, the asteroid theory. Does it explain the extinction of dinosaurs? There are problems. There is the frog problem. You see, there are thousands of species of tropical frog today, and frogs are immortal as family of species. They never suffer mass extinction. When the mammoths went extinct, the frogs survived. When the dinosaurs went extinct, the frogs survived. And frogs are very delicate animals, very delicate to climate change. If you smack the Earth today with an asteroid, blotted out the sun, you would freeze frogs long before you'd freeze a big animal. What kills off big animals like dinosaurs or elephants? What does an elephant do that a frog doesn't? Elephants spread. Dr. Bakker points out that large land animals, such as elephants, travel enormous distances in the course of their lives. In this sense, dinosaurs resemble today's fast-moving beasts, capable of traversing large expanses of terrain. And towards the end of the Cretaceous period, dinosaurs do seem to have gone traveling in large numbers. Newly formed land bridges connected previously isolated continents and made it possible for dinosaurs, if they wished, to walk from Mongolia to Montana. This brought different species of dinosaur into contact with one another for the first time, which leads to the theory of dinosaur extinction favored by Dr. Bakker. Bakker points out that in the late 19th century, the disease Rinderpest spread from Asia to Africa, threatening the extinction of nearly 40 species of African antelope. In the same way, he argues, when dinosaurs crossed the land bridges, they were exposed to new strains of disease that could have wreaked havoc among dinosaur populations like the colonists who brought measles to the Americas. When dinosaurs spread, they spread disease and became in turn the victims of their own relentless exploration. What caused the dinosaurs to vanish from the Earth? No one knows for sure. There is no agreement on a most likely answer. But what we do know as a result of the surge in dinosaur studies over the last 40 years, is that the old picture of dinosaurs was wrong. These were not sluggish, small-brained blimps. They were gloriously varied creatures, some striding boldly along on four legs, others skimming the ground on two. Some were hot-blooded, many were gregarious and social. They traveled far and wide, armed and ready to do battle for food, or to die in defense of their young. Tyrannosaurus rex, Iguanodon, Brontosaurus, Deinonychus, Stegosaurus. Though long dead and buried, they still roam free in the forests of our imaginations. And more of their kind wait still, frozen in stone, to enthrall those who come after us. Children and scientists alike.
Okay, so the dinosaurs went extinct. Things like Allosaurus and all its giant kin died out. Is that a tragedy for everybody? Well, no. If you were small, you survived. And if you were small and furry and had a twitchy nose and beady eyes like this chap, you could evolve into a wonderful range of big mammal families. You could evolve into moose, you could evolve into aardvarks, into warthogs, into apes, into humans. So from an ancestor like this, people. Humankind owes its success story to the extinction of giant dinosaurs. was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the financial support of viewers like you. As an additional service of this station, the Dinosaurs series is available from PBS Home Video. To order by credit card, call 1-800-PLAY-PBS. This is PBS.
America's greatest legends. But the real story of how and why it happened is buried in myth. This was a modern army, artillery, and Gatling guns. There was no way that they could lose. My grandfather, one of Custer's scouts, told Custer they would all die that day. Last Stand at Little Bighorn, tonight on The American Experience. Okay. I'll make sure that's the end of it. Uh, uh,
Thanks for taking my 15. It comes after 12. Five thirteen, you are go for fire alarm and docking. All systems are nominal and on the line. Okay, S4B is stable. Flop panels are drifting free. The drogue is clear. The docking target is clear. Yeah, I'm coming up on that town. What? Mark. Seventy-five feet. We're coming up on docking. Let's shut down some thrusters. See what he does with this one. Whoa! Well, wait a minute. Uh, I lost something here. I can't translate up. Houston, we are drifting down and away. Right, we'll just back off and hang on the right. No, no, I got it. I got it. Let me uh, just try and get you stable here. Houston, I'm gonna reset the high gate. I got the target back in the reticle. Okay, we're stable. Go ahead and recycle the valves. is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the financial support of viewers like you. The story of dinosaurs in modern times begins in the 18th century in Holland, the city of Maastricht. Once 70 million years ago, this was the bottom of a sea, a warm sea, and here limestone was formed. For centuries, the people of Maastricht quarried this limestone for buildings, burrowing into the rocks to create a vast warren of caves.
25 years later, the jaw of the monster attracted the attention of the French Revolutionary Army, who occupied Maastricht in 1795. They claimed the jawbone for France, where to this day it reposes in the National Museum of Natural History in Paris. Soon after the French Revolution, the National Museum was the scene of another revolution. This one led by a celebrated professional scientist, Georges Cuvier. Cuvier was professor of comparative anatomy, which was a booming branch of science at that time. And it was the very best place in the world for him to be, because I think the museum there probably had a larger collection than anywhere else in the world of um, uh, skeletons and skins and, to some extent, pickled guts and so on, uh, of a whole range of, of living species from all around the world. Like the other professors, he lived on the job. He had a house which went with the job, which was on the, in the same grounds as the museum and the botanic gardens. And the botanic gardens included, as it still does, a small zoo. So he had access to at least a small collection of living animals, which he could study and see how they moved, how they put their anatomy to good use. So he was in a very good position to understand the relation between bones and muscles and sense organs and gut and everything else within a living creature and see how it could they all those parts of the body contributed to a whole way of life. Cuvier had a theory. Huge bones had been found beneath the streets of Paris. They looked like elephant bones, except that they belonged to a creature that was clearly a different species, now called a mastodon. Cuvier reasoned that these bones belonged to an animal that had become extinct. And it was really the first time that there was a really good, pretty strong case for, for extinction. Then one day, Cuvier turned his attention to the huge jawbone, the trophy from Maastricht. And he compared it with living reptiles and concluded this time that it was an enormous marine lizard. Cuvier had opened the door to a past buried far deeper than anyone had imagined. And the search he began has continued to this day. Marine lizards, like the monster from Maastricht, now identified as a mosasaur, populated the seas during the millions of years when dinosaurs reigned supreme on land. These sea creatures are what lured paleontologist Christopher McGowan here to Williston Lake in the Canadian Rocky Mountains. Well, 30 years ago, we'd have been walking along here, but there was a dam put in on this Peace River and flooded this whole valley. And we've got this monstrous great, very cold lake. And we can see all along this new coastline, which was once, of course, halfway up the mountain, we've got these rock exposures and these rock exposures are upper Triassic in age and 220 million years ago this whole thing this whole area was one vast sea and it was warm probably quite pleasant and in those warm seas were all sorts of animals the most interesting from my point of view are these wonderful reptiles the sea dragons The sea dragons McGowan has come in search of are ichthyosaurs. Ichthyosaurs were once as abundant in the sea as dinosaurs were on land. But this one gives us a nice picture of what a complete ichthyosaur looks like. You can see, starting up at the sharp end here, they got this long pointed snout, lots of teeth, all the better for grabbing at fishes. Very, very large eye socket here, very large eye. And they don't have legs as such, they have fins here. Well, the whole thing looks very fishy, doesn't it, really? And this is why they got the name ichthyosaur, meaning fish lizard. After Maastricht, more finds were reported from all over Europe as quarrymen and miners dug through rocks laid down over 200 million years ago, in the period of geologic time known as the Triassic, and the two periods that followed, the 
Jurassic and the Cretaceous. Here were the inhabitants of ancient oceans. Mosasaurs, like the creature from Maastricht. Plesiosaurs and Ichthyosaurs. And above them, flying reptiles called Pterosaurs, who had developed thin membranes across the bones of their fingers that made them capable of taking to the air.
Mantel was still a long way from reconstructing his animal. But then, a jumble of bones was unearthed from a quarry in Maidstone, Kent. Mantel made this sketch of the remains. The Maidstone specimen. It was discovered in 1834, and it was blasted out of a quarry. Um, you can still see here the, the blast hole where the thing was actually blown to pieces. Um, it was glued back together, uh, more or less. So what did he do? Well, he looked at this jumble of bones. He could see, for example, over here, there's a row of vertebrae from the backbone. If you look at the center of the slab, you can see that there are these long brown bones here. These are evidently leg bones of one sort or another. And yet, up here, there's a scattering of toe bones. So you've, you've clearly got a real jigsaw puzzle. And he was presented with this problem. How did this puzzle actually fit together? Once again, it was a tooth that gave Mantell the clue he needed. On the inside of this surface, you can see a series of quite broad ridges running down the surface of the tooth. And then right along this edge, there are some very, very fine ridges. And they're absolutely characteristic of an iguana lizard. By the mid-1830s, Mantell had accumulated enough evidence in the form of teeth, bones, and pieces to be able to attempt what you see here, which is the first ever reconstruction of one of these extinct giant reptiles. If you look very carefully at the diagram, there are one or two interesting features that you can see. In the backbone, there are groups of four vertebrae, and they're just like the ones that you can see on the mantelpiece. In addition, on the front of the head, there's this tiny conical spike. Which to Mantell looked much like the spike on an iguana lizard. Very interestingly, he's got the horn on the end of the nose. He then said, this is a giant extinct relative of the living iguana, and therefore he gave it a very appropriate name. He called it Iguanodon, which means literally iguana tooth. The Iguanodon became Mantell's obsession to the exclusion of all else. Marianne Mantell took their only daughter and left him. At the end of his life, bankrupt, bereft, sick, Mantell sold his entire collection of bones to the British Museum. Twenty years after Mrs. Mantell's discovery in Tilgate Forest, the fossil creatures were finally given a collective name by this man, British paleontologist Sir Richard Owen. Owen was already famous for piecing together a giant extinct bird, a moa, from just one fragment of leg bone. Then in 1841, he wrote a long and learned report. And at the end, he put in some more speculative remarks. And among these, he claimed that a certain uh, fossil reptiles that had been discovered in the years before this time uh, were quite unlike any living reptile, so much unlike that they deserve to have a major uh, group named for them. And he promptly named them dinosaurs, dinosauria in the Latin form. Which means in its English form, terrible lizards. Here they are, as conceived by British sculptor Waterhouse Hawkins. Hawkins heard about Owen's dinosaurs while he was working on designs for the famous Crystal Palace exhibition in London that had been built to celebrate the brilliant achievements of modern man. The Great Exhibition of 1851 was the first big exhibition of its kind in the world. It was housed in a spectacular piece of architecture, an enormous building completely made of glass and steel. Inspired by Owen's vision of these terrible lizards and seizing the opportunity offered by the exhibition, Hawkins contacted Owen, and together they designed a fossil zoo based on Waterhouse Hawkins' sketches to be housed on the grounds of the Crystal Palace. In 1853, the zoo was complete enough for Owen to host a dinner party inside a half-finished iguanodon. The following year, 1854, the exhibit was opened and 40,000 people attended on the first day. So altogether, this made a complete, uh, very spectacular and complete age of reptiles, 
which seem to have preceded the age of mammals and which in turn had preceded the age of man. The animals still stand there as Owen and Hawkins envisioned them. came from the other side of the Atlantic. Peter Dodson is professor of paleontology at the University of Pennsylvania. These goings on in Britain were all very well and good, but it took discoveries here in America to really advance the science of paleontology. This is the very first American dinosaur discovery. This tooth was tantalizing rather than informative. The most exciting dinosaur discovery was a discovery of this skeleton in New Jersey, in Haddonfield, New Jersey. These bones were sent to Professor Leidy at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. Leidy was a brilliant paleontologist and anatomist. He named the skeleton Hadrosaurus. This was the first duck-billed dinosaur. In studying this skeleton, he realized that the thigh bone was very big and heavy, just what you would expect from the, an animal that weighed as much as an elephant. But the bones of the forelimb, the front leg, were very light, rather short, slender. This was not an animal which could have walked on all fours. It could not have supported its weight on its front legs. And thus was born the concept of the upright, two-legged dinosaur. very long, powerful back legs, ideal for supporting a very heavy animal. Added to that, you've got a very long, powerful tail and quite short front legs compared with the back legs. Now, these are the proportions of something like a kangaroo. So not surprisingly, Louis Dollo had them reconstructed on this metal frame in a very kangaroo-like posture. Louis Dollo cleared up one other mystery as well. Do you remember that conical bone? It looked rather like a rhinoceros horn that Mantell had had so many problems with. He put it on the nose of his iguanodon. Louis Dollo proved that it wasn't at all on the nose of this creature. It was a defensive weapon, all right, but it was on the hand. It was his thumb. These reconstructions of Louis Dollo have stood here for the best part of 100 years and largely unchallenged. And it's not surprising, he was working on complete fossil skeletons. 
However, not even Dollo was immune to the odd mistake. If you know where to look, you can find a few yourself. Let me show you one. Back here in the tail, you can see that it has a lovely curvature. The back end of the tail rests on the ground, and it curves smoothly up to the hips for this animal, just like that of a kangaroo. However, if you look closely at the vertebrae, you can see that in a number of places, the bones are actually dislocated. Here, and here. In fact, Dollo probably broke those to make that smoothly curved tail. So if we straighten the tail like we really should, as we've seen, that brings the chest down much more close to the ground. And naturally enough, the arms are going to fall very close to the ground, and the hands can be used as they really should have been for walking. That would have made a guandon a quite adequate quadruped, and perhaps one that Owen would have actually been rather pleased about. So has David Norman finally reconstructed Iguanodon right? Well, we've got it right for the moment. Meanwhile, in 1877, just before Dalo's Iguanodons came to light, the American West had been the scene of a remarkable scientific showdown. High noon over dinosaur bones. Paleontologist Robert Bacher. This is Como Bluff, Wyoming. To me, the most beautiful place in the world. Because it was here at Como. In 1877, the first complete dinosaur skeletons were found, and suddenly dinosaurs became famous worldwide. So illustrious were the finds here among bone diggers that the greatest minds in paleontology were willing to wage war right here. The war was fought between Othniel Charles Marsh of Yale University and Edward Drinker Cope of Philadelphia, two wealthy scientists and lifelong rivals. We're just across the river from Philadelphia. This was Cope's territory. He had it staked out. These, these pits also happened to be rich in fossils. And Cope arranged with the pit operators to receive a steady stream of fossils. Cope's problems began when Marsh asked if he could come along on a fossil collecting trip. So Cope accommodated Marsh and brought him down right into the pit. And they collected fossils, found lots and lots of things, even a few dinosaurs. They had a wonderful time. They parted good friends. They even named species after each other. But Cope didn't realize that Marsh was taking notes. And Marsh actually paid off the quarry operators. And so the steady stream of fossils that had been coming to Cope dried up. In 1867, the new Transcontinental Railroad was pushing through a remote area of Wyoming. Two railroad men, William Carlin and William Reed, had learned about the new interest in dinosaur fossils back east and wrote to Professor Marsh in New Haven, telling him about some bones they had found while hunting antelope. What they discovered were huge heaps of leg bones and ribs. It was the most colossal pile of dinosaur remains ever found. Carlin and Reed had just kicked off a gigantic Jurassic gold rush. Marsh, using his own private fortune, financed the two railroad men to prospect for bones and send them back to him at Yale University. Back to the east went trainload after trainload of Marsh's dinosaurs. 30 cars or more, hundreds of tons. The tons of bones coming into New Haven excited the envy of Professor Cope in Philadelphia. He sent his own men out to try to sniff around, to try to steal bones from under Marsh's nose. Uh, these men were dinosaur rustlers. For 15 glorious years, the digging went on here. From 1877 to 1892. Nothing like it has come since. 
And the dinosaurs that came from here not only filled museums, they filled magazine articles, encyclopedias, textbooks. They filled people's minds with the whole wonderful pantheon of Jurassic dinosaurs. Brontosaurus, Stegosaurus, Allosaurus, Morosaurus, Creosaurus, the whole glorious crew. In the final tally, Cope identified 56 new species. But Marsh came out ahead. His total of new species was 80. Out of this fierce competition came enough fossils to form the nucleus of three or four of the world's greatest collections of dinosaur remains, including those at the Yale Peabody Museum, the American Museum of Natural History in New York, and the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. Cope died in 1897, two years before his rival, Marsh. But Cope issued one last challenge. In his will, Cope specified that his skull be preserved and his brain be measured. Because in those days, many scientists believed that brain size was, was the true measure of intelligence. And Cope was confident that science would show that he was more intelligent than his hated rival. But Marsh never rose to the challenge, so we will never know the truth. However, Cope's wishes were respected. And we have his skull right here in Philadelphia. In the days of Cope and Marsh, dinosaurs were assumed to be reptiles, huge lizards. But this picture began to change, in part because of the finds made here in Utah. 150 million years ago, this land was flat. But 60 million years ago, gigantic forces crumbled the land tilting it on its side, and the secrets buried in the silt of that river were exposed. Curator of the Carnegie Museum, Chris Kristolka. One of the first guys to work this area was Earl Douglas. He was sent out here by the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh in 1909 to find dinosaurs and bring them back to the museum. Douglas was a down-to-earth guy, a folksy paleontologist. He didn't want to disappoint his people back in Pittsburgh. And he spent two months during the summer of 1909 prospecting and scrambling over rock faces, such as this one. And on August 17th, success, he came across huge vertebrae embedded in the rock face, part of the backbone of a giant sauropod dinosaur. Well, finding the bones is one thing and getting him out of the rock is quite another. Douglas had no idea that the whole project would take 15 years. One of the reasons it took 15 years is because the rock surrounding these bones is very, very hard. And Douglas had an answer to that problem, giant powder. And Gennar lingo is dynamite. <laughs> of dinosaur bones anywhere in the world, greater even than the finds in Como Bluff. Over the next 15 years, he shipped 350 tons of them back to Carnegie Museum. But here in Vernal, Utah, he kept part of his find intact exactly where he dug them up, sheltered now from the elements by a glass and steel hanger in Dinosaur National Monument. But how did these bones get here in the first place? Well, 150 million years ago, when this rock layer was deposited by a flowing river, dinosaur carcasses floated down the river, piled up on a sandbar, one carcass on top of another on top of another. 
a jumble of dinosaur carcasses on a sandbar makes for a jumble of dinosaur bones in a preserved quarry. Here's a good illustration of the jumble of dinosaur bones in this rock layer. Here we have mostly bones of Apatosaurus. Here we have part of the pelvis, thigh bones, and lower leg bones, but straddled across this Apatosaurus jumble of bones is a bone of Diplodocus, another sauropod. Carnegie, who had financed Douglas on his trips, ordered life-size models to be made and shipped to a number of museums in Europe. But some paleontologists took exception to the upright pose. They thought its legs should be splayed out like a crocodile. After all, dinosaurs were big lizards, and they should be made to crawl like lizards, shouldn't they? Not according to the Carnegie Museum. If dinosaurs moved around like lizards, they would have to drag their bellies along the ground or sprawl in specially dug out trenches. Either that, or stay submerged in water to offset their enormous weight. The correct stance of dinosaurs was hotly debated for the next 30 years. Until 1938, when Roland T. Byrd rode into town. The town he rode into was Glen Rose, Texas. Roland T. Byrd was a high school dropout who had gone to work for the American Museum of Natural History and would ride the back roads of the West on a Harley searching for dinosaurs. At an Indian trading post in Glen Rose, he found a slab of rock for sale and in it, tracks of dinosaurs. Paleontologist Jim Farlow. This is it. This is the Paluxy River near the town of Glen Rose, Texas, and this is the place that made R.T. Bird famous. It was here in the bed of this river that R.T. Bird found the first sauropod footprints. People had known of the skeletal remains of sauropods for many years, but up till now no one had ever found any sauropod footprints you could be certain about. This is the place where they got them. So R.T. really hit scientific pay dirt here. I told the men we'd have to build a coffer dam to shut out the water. They rolled up their pant legs and started bailing. By the time the boys finished the bailing, they laid bare several thousand feet of track. It was the largest dinosaur track quarry ever opened. The ancient Egyptians would have marveled at how little things had changed. The threat of rain was ever with us. Once lightning hit my Buick, made a hole in the top. There's still a lot of good tracks in this river. Uh, when the water level is low, you can see them quite clearly, but the water's fairly high today, so obviously there's not much to see here except water. However, there is a very nice sauropod trail here, and I've marked it to show you the sequence of left and right tracks made by the hind foot of the dinosaur. So we can walk along here. That was one I didn't mark, but here's a right hind foot that I marked. Left hind, right hind, left, right, left, and right. Now, this is a big animal. This is an animal bigger than a hippopotamus. It's not a very big sauropod, but it's a big animal by anybody's book. And yet, look how close together the tracks made by the left and right hand sides of the dinosaur are. If this animal had been walking in a sprawling lizard-like fashion, I don't think I could reach the span with my hands. 
but they're very close together, and that indicates that the dinosaur walked with its legs directly beneath its body in a very erect fashion. This is a chart that R.T. Bird made of his excavation of dinosaur footprints in 1940, and it tells a really interesting story. You can see, first of all, the footprints of the sauropod dinosaur, the big plant eater. There's a hind foot impression of the animal, and there's its associated front foot impression. We see that there's a very good left-right sequencing of these footprints along the length of the trail. Associated with this particular trackway, we also find footprints of a meat-eating dinosaur. It really looks as though the meat-eater was, was following the plant-eater, perhaps to uh, invite it for lunch. In fact, Bird thought he saw evidence that the two dinosaurs had actually struggled, at least for a moment. As we follow the meat-eater's tracks, we get good left-right sequencing of the footprints until we come to here at which point we go from a right foot to another right foot impression. In other words, right here, there is a missing left foot print. How do you account for that missing track? What Bird thought had happened was that the meat-eating dinosaur had actually physically caught onto the back of the dinosaur that it was chasing, and because the sauropod was so much bigger, had been literally jerked out of its tracks for a second. It made a little hop here, and the left foot didn't get a chance to touch the ground. Well, I don't know if that's true or not, but it is a very dramatic story, and it's the kind of story you could only get from footprints. You wouldn't be able to get that kind of scenario from a skeleton. If R.T. Bird was the easy rider of dinosaur studies, it's Indiana Jones was Roy Chapman Andrews. Andrews' greatest adventure started at the American Museum of Natural History in 1920. He had invited Henry Fairfield Osborne, president of the American Museum, to lunch. Allegedly, after this pleasant lunch, uh, Osborne puffed on his cigar and said, um, well, what do you have in mind? What's all this for? And Roy laid out a very, very uh, elaborate plan, exciting plan for exploration of Central Asia. Andrew set up a base camp in Beijing and from there, the expedition set out for Inner Mongolia. They bought a fleet of dodges, vehicles with spindly wheels, to go across the Gobi. And they hired about 125 camels. The camels carried the gasoline. The vehicles carried the people. Roy Chapman Andrews assembled a power team of scientists, a wide variety of specialists, because the whole idea was to do a description of the Gobi Desert in all respects, in all dimensions, not just paleontologically. In a series of five separate expeditions in the 1920s, Andrew scoured the deserts of Mongolia for bones. It was rugged. Desert sandstorms would rip the tents out of the ground or the shirts off their backs. Sudden drenching rain showers turned the ground to axle-deep sludge. But the harsh majesty of the landscape lifted their spirits. Everyone was enthusiastic over the beauty of the great flat-topped mesa on the border of the Badlands Basin. Its surface was covered with black lava, but the sides were blood red. The spot was almost paved with bones. With its sculptured ramparts, it was the richest locality of the world from a paleontological standpoint. We named it the Flaming Cliffs. was ingenious. 
When he ran out of burlap, he used camel hair packing to wrap the fossils. The technique has not changed much since then. Only the materials have gotten a little better. They found large deposits of dinosaur skeletons. But it was on their second trip that Andrews and his party made a discovery that would secure his place in the history of dinosaur studies. It was July 13, 1923. They had returned to the flaming cliffs. We saw a small sandstone ledge, beside which were lying three eggs, partly broken. The brown striated shell was so egg-like that there could be no mistake. These must be dinosaur eggs. The prospect was thrilling. No dinosaur eggs had ever been found, and we would not let ourselves think of it too seriously. Scientists do things this way. They tend not to accept things right away because they're just afraid to say that, wow, we've made such a great discovery. And it was only after some deliberation that they decided, yep, couldn't be anything else. They have to be dinosaur eggs. 20-foot-long carnivores growing out of 10-inch-long hatchlings, two-ton monsters laying eggs. Seventy years after the first Andrews expedition, these images are in the thoughts of scientists from the American Museum of Natural History as they prepare to go out again to the Gobi Desert in 1992. They've already been there twice before, in 1990 and 1991, with their colleagues from the Mongolian Academy of Sciences. They go in search of evidence that dinosaurs are, in a sense, still with us. Most people, when they think of expeditions, paleontological expeditions, they envision people walking over a great expanse of plain and then say, well, I bet the dinosaurs are here and start digging a deep hole, 200 feet deep, until they hit pay dirt. Well, that's not the way it is. We look for bone weathering on the surface. We walk. And a paleontologist spends most of his time in the field walking until they find a big accumulation of bones and then start digging around or coring. But most, most of this is, is field reconnaissance, walking and, and, and looking. They never touch the specimens. When they find something, the scientists wrap the rock that encases the fossil in a plaster cast bandage. They end up with plaster boulders of varying sizes ready to pack up and carry away. Turn it over, turn it over. <laughs> and it doesn't look like there's any bone on this side, so we've got the whole skull. All the real scientific work goes on once you get the material back to your museum, to your university, to your institute, and you have a chance to work on it. Dr. Malcolm McKenna of the American Museum will spend weeks, even months, on this meticulous work. You spend a lot of time very delicately chipping away unwanted bits of what we call matrix on the outside of the bone. You can simply chip away a little bit here. Uh, I'm removing actually just a tiny little bit at a time and then it's cleaned away with some air and uh, we look at it and then we go at it some more. What is being revealed by all this grows logically out of the fact that not all dinosaurs were giants. We think of dinosaurs generally as these massive animals. But there are some very small and delicate creatures with long necks and some of them almost elongate jaws that remind you a bit of bird beaks and very smooth skulls and very long limbs with big claws. And these groups of theropod dinosaurs seem to be giving us clues to the beginnings of birds because they look a little bit like birds. Dinosaurs into birds? It's not an entirely new concept. In the 19th century, Sir Richard Owen and Thomas Huxley, the great British Darwinist, had the same idea. But for years, while scientists conceded that dinosaurs and birds may have had a common ancestor, most refused to believe that birds were descended directly from dinosaurs. And then in 1970, that all changed. 
Some scientists questioned whether pterosaurs, the small broad-winged reptiles that had taken to the air, could do more than glide. Could they actually fly, like birds? Pterosaurs had long been an interest of Yale University's John Ostrom. One day, Ostrom went to look at a specimen of a pterosaur at the Tyler Museum in Harlem, Holland. And uh, when I saw that specimen, within the first couple of seconds, I knew that it was misidentified. Basically, nobody had seen that specimen right. And I can't tell you. The adrenaline started flowing, the pulse rate went up. I was holding an unknown specimen of Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx, a small bone theropod, had been famous since a specimen was unearthed in Germany in 1860. Since then, only a handful, all incomplete, had ever been found. These are replicas of most of the specimens of Archaeopteryx. The most famous animal, perhaps, of all. And this is the prize, the gem of all of these, the famous Berlin specimen of Archaeopteryx. It was found in 1877. Perhaps, no, not perhaps, it is, without question in my mind, the most valuable specimen of anything in the world. between birds and reptiles. Look at the head, look at the skull, and in the mouth, teeth. Birds don't have teeth today. Uh, it has a long reptilian-like tail. The feet, on the other hand, are very similar to what we find in most modern birds. Not all, but most. And then, most important of all, on the arms are feathers, clear but faint impressions of feathers that were attached to the forearms. Details almost precisely like the details of modern feathers. And that raised an immediate question in my mind. If they are so much alike, perhaps birds came directly from some dinosaurian group.
Dinosaurs was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the financial support of viewers like you. As an additional service of this station, the Dinosaurs series is available from PBS Home Video. To order by credit card, call 1-800-PLAY-PBS. This is PBS. is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the financial support of viewers like you. Dinosaurs have vanished from the face of the Earth. But from beneath the Earth, their bones still cast a spell luring paleontologists, tourists, and amateur bone hunters, even to such out-of-the-way places as Jordan, Montana. For the folks of Garfield County, prospecting for bones is a hobby that can get exciting at any moment. On Labor Day, 1988, Ranchers Tom and Kathy Wankel drove out into the Montana hills. Oh, I've always been a rock hound all my life. I've, I've um, loved arrowheads and about anything old, and I've always walked around looking at the ground. Well, that morning we had the good fortune of having babysitters for our kids, so we were on our own, and we wanted to get out early when the, the morning light seemed to be more productive. I had hiked around the low part of one set of hills and he'd went another way but we met at the top of one small hill and out of the corner of my eye I'd spotted a ridge of bones and um, I don't know just I was shaking I remember that. After she dug it up a little bit you know and scratched around she got more and more excited and she said I think I hope this is a mega find. 
turned out to be just that, a, a mega find, very important. Kathy Wangle had found an almost complete Tyrannosaurus rex, one of the rarest finds in the history of dinosaur studies. And now a crew of paleontologists from the Museum of the Rockies is painstakingly easing the skeleton out of its rocky cradle. you to the largest painting in the world. It portrays time over a span of about 50 million years from the Devonian period back in the Paleozoic all the way up to the end of the dinosaur era, the end of the Mesozoic. It's called the Age of Reptiles. picture of dinosaurs, pea-brained giants lumbering through lush tropical foliage, gorging themselves on leaves and grass. For years, the stereotype was magnificently represented by this mural. Since the 40s, when it was painted, a number of discoveries have been made, and new ideas have been thrown into the debate. And perhaps one of the most important discoveries was made by me. It was 1964. John Ostrom recalls that he had been digging for months in Low County, Montana, and not finding very much. Time had run out. His crew had packed up their equipment and were heading for their cars. You know, we'd been looking for five years before we found anything as exciting as this. Close to where the cars were parked, Ostrom noticed something in the rock. Since his tools were already stowed away, he began to scrape the dirt with his fingernails. This is what he saw first. Startling. I, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. Notice the extraordinarily large claws, sharp, curved, clearly the hands of a predaceous animal. Uh, associated, found very close to this, uh, was this object, obviously a claw which I thought belonged to the hand because it looks very much like the claws on those fingers. But there was no place for it to fit. And I puzzled over that for some time. But we found the answer. Turns out that that claw didn't belong to the hand at all. In fact, it belonged to the foot. Then something more came to light in our quarry. And uh, I'll show you just a part of it. Bits and pieces of the tail. 
encased in bundles of ossified tendons all along each right side, left side, underneath. This made the tail completely stiff, like a what I picture as a balancing pole. It kept the animal, helped the animal keep its balance while it was using those sickles on its feet for killing whatever it was hungry for. Ostrom named the animal Deinonychus, terrible claw, a killing machine that came into being more than a hundred million years ago and used both hands and feet to snatch and rend its prey, keeping its balance by the remarkable adaptation in its tail. Nothing like the galumphing brutes in the Yale Neuro, but a speedy acrobat, a racer.
looked around at the dinosaur tracks, I started off with uh, the really famous ones from Texas and worked out the speed of the big sauropod dinosaurs there. And oh dear, they were, they were slower than I am. Real slow human walking speed. But what about the sauropod's top speed? Speed takes power. That means the faster an animal runs, the stronger its legs have to be in relation to its bulk. By calculating the strength of dinosaur leg bones, Alexander was able to make some comparisons. An elephant can trot along at about 16 miles an hour. That was probably top speed for a patasaurus. A rhinoceros hits 20 miles an hour. Triceratops just might have been able to keep up. How fast could Tyrannosaurus move? Alexander thinks its bones were relatively weak. But there are no footprints with which to calculate its speed. He thinks it could have chased you at about 15 miles an hour. Others don't give you such good odds. They clock Tyrannosaurus at 20 miles an hour or more. Alexander formula is about to be applied. Grad student Grace Irby and paleontologist Jim Farlow are looking for a set of dinosaur footprints. They ought to be around here somewhere. Because paleontologist R.T. Bird reported in the 1930s that he'd seen them. Bird never wrote down the exact location. He did leave one clue, though, a snapshot of himself on the site. Paleontologist Scott Madsden, a colleague of Farlow's and Irby's, found the photograph in an old book. He recognized the rock formations in the background. This looks like a good match. Yeah, I think you're right. Bird's secret was out. Government work, yeah. 
Okay, take the hip height. Now the Alexander formula. Y to the X, 1.17, change of sign equals 0.621. And we get the beast. Looks like he's just trotting along at around 11 miles per hour. Can you run that fast? No. Farlo has found some more tracks. These stretch him beyond his limits. A 25 mile an hour dinosaur dash. Faster than the Olympic sprint champion. This in turn raises a new question. A hot blooded animal, a lion for instance, keeps its body temperature constant and is active even on cold nights when the external temperature is low. It does this by a process scientists call endothermy. A cold-blooded animal, by contrast, will be cold and inert when the air around it is cold, and active only when its internal temperature is raised by the warmth of the sun. When the cool night air returns, back the animal goes to its resting state. Scientists call this ectothermy. Today, most fast-moving agile animals use endothermy. They are hot-blooded. But dinosaurs are supposedly reptiles, and reptiles are cold-blooded. So were dinosaurs hot-blooded or cold-blooded? A zoo is as good a place as any to find out. Paleontologist Bob Bakker. We're here in the uh, National Zoo, where they're about to feed fabulous furballs, that is, small mammals, hot-blooded animals. And the essence of being hot-blooded is eating, eating lots, eating all the time. If you're hot-blooded, your body furnace just churns up calories, your dietary chores are just never done, never. Cold-bloodedness is a whole different thing. Um, good example, a meat-eating cat in the wild. Uh, how much does your Jeffrey's cat weigh about? Approximately eight pounds. Eight pounds, okay. Um, total weight of food, you'd offer it? We offer week? between three to five pounds. Three to five, like, uh, okay. Here's five pounds of meat. That's uh, a weekly ration for a small carnivorous mammal, small hot blood. Let's exchange the mammal for a lizard now. Okay. Cold-blooded lizard on the same diet in the same habitat, a zoo or the wild, you would only need the corner of this. Less than a quarter of a pound, one twentieth as much meat per week for the lizard because it's cold-blooded. Warm-bloodedness is a wonderful adaptation, but it carries a tremendous price. The price of eating all the time at fabulous rates. The enormous difference in food intake between reptiles and mammals gives Bakker what he needs to test his idea about dinosaurs. Among hot-blooded predators, there's a definite ratio of predator to prey. If a predator is hot-blooded, it needs to eat 50 times its own weight a year to stay alive, with the result that among hot-blooded animals, 2% are predators, the rest are prey. A cold-blooded predator, on the other hand, such as a crocodile, needs to eat only five times its own weight a year to survive. So the percentage of predators to prey is higher. When you look at the dinosaurs that have been collected, what percentage are predators? A hot-blooded 2% or a cold-blooded 20%? Well, I'll tell you what the number is. The number is 1 to 3%. 1 to 3% of all the dinosaur tonnage is meat-eater, and that's a hot-blooded number. A hot-blooded reptile? Such a creature exists nowhere else in nature. And yet in one important respect, dinosaurs did indeed behave as though they were hot-blooded. They appear to have traveled great distances. No part of the world we know now was out of bounds to dinosaurs. Their remains turn up everywhere. Hadrosaurs in Japan. Protoceratops in Mongolia. Stegosaurs all the way from Europe to Africa. Huge sauropods everywhere in North and South America. And perhaps 
else most significantly of all, Hadrosars and Ceratopsians in Alaska. The North Slope of Alaska, 100 miles above the Arctic Circle. Most of the year it's a frozen wasteland, but for a month in summer, the temperature climbs as high as 40 degrees. A team of scientists has taken advantage of the relatively balmy weather to look for evidence that would help settle the debate over dinosaurs' body temperatures. Let us suppose dinosaurs were hot-blooded. How could they have weathered the climate here? Most dinosaurs had no fur and no feathers to keep them warm. And what would they have eaten? Does anybody want any bagels? Yeah. Much depends on what the Arctic was like at the time, 90 million years ago. The researchers split into two parties. While one crew sets out to look for bones and more clues to the body temperature of dinosaurs, a second group, consisting of paleobotanists Judy Parrish and Bob Spicer, flies 100 miles downriver on the trail of a different quarry, fossil plants. I'll, uh, I'll go and prospect the plants. Okay. Judy Parrish. This is an impression of a log that's uh, about 90 million years old. We can see the pattern of the wood. This may be an impression of the bark here. And uh, we can see that it was a large tree. We know from other samples of trees from this age rock that these trees had very wide growth rings. And what that tells us is that during the growing season, they grew very happily. Uh, tree rings have got usually light and dark bands. The light band is laid down when the tree is growing during the summer. And the dark band is laid down in the fall if the uh, growing season has a cool part to it. These trees don't have a dark band, or they have a very, very thin dark band, and that shows that they were growing very rapidly during the growing season, and then stopped abruptly. And from the fossil leaves, Spicer and Parrish can deduce what the weather was like. Here in prehistoric Alaska, the temperature averaged about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. But could dinosaurs have survived in such a climate? One answer is visible right here, only a hundred miles away, where the other party has been working. Over 1,000 dinosaur bones have been collected on this slope in the last 10 years. Paleontologist Andy Crumhart. This is the very bottom of the bone bed. And as you can see, there's just piles and piles of bones just all jammed together. It started, I hit this little tip of a bone right here. This is a scapula. That's your shoulder blade bone right here, the young individual. And in taking that out, I ran into bone on either side. There's a long fibula bone right here, which is a leg bone. There's a rib here, um, an arm bone here. I think another arm bone here, which is pretty well destroyed. It's, it's not in very good condition. It's going to continue underneath me and continue that way, and I'm going to have to take out some of the side here and some of this back here um, to probably finish it off. And no doubt it goes back into the bank as well. So in the summer, at least, dinosaurs were plentiful here and would have had enough sun and food to survive. The climate might have been no more severe than fall in Maine. But what about the winter, when the sun would shine as little as four hours a day? What did the dinosaurs do? Did they hibernate?
maybe hundreds or thousands at a time, moving north in the spring, following the, the spring flush of growth, spending the summer on the Arctic slope where lots of food was to be had, and daylight was constant, and then as the, the year waned and the winter came on, moving south again. in almost freezing weather, but maybe they could. Dragon 2, this is Dragon 1. Dragon 2, this is Dragon 1. Come in, please. Tamarindo on Costa Rica's Pacific Coast. Yeah, this is the North Team. I'm uh, reaching the end of my uh, run, and I haven't seen any tracks yet. I think it's a little early. Jim Spartilla is an animal physiologist from Drexel University in Philadelphia. Along with his colleagues, he's looking for a leatherback turtle. The leatherback is the largest extant marine reptile, and every year it makes a 2,000-mile journey to tropical Costa Rica from cool northern Pacific waters to lay its eggs. is the 
turtle's breath for oxygen and carbon dioxide content. From that, he will derive the metabolic rate. That, in turn, will tell him whether the turtle is hot or cold-blooded. The results we've obtained here are very exciting and quite unique because they have shown us that although the leatherback's energy consumption is somewhat higher than we would expect for a reptile of this size, it is very unlike the large mammals such as elephants and birds that I've worked with in the past. Uh, the metabolism of these le leatherbacks is truly reptilian. But if the turtle is cold-blooded, and if dinosaurs were too, then how can they make the long journey from Alaska to warmer climates? For turtles, it may be that they can swim. But how would the dinosaurs have made the trip? The answer, says Spotilla, lies in their huge bulk. Big objects, whether they're houses or turtles, reptiles, mammals, all heat and cool slower than small objects. It's that combination of insulation and body size that accounts for it being warm. And we call that gigantothermy. And the leatherback is a great example of gigantothermy. And the only better example of gigantothermy was probably the dinosaurs. She's all set. As soon as she gets her bearings, I think she'll just walk into the water. The theory of gigantothermy, that an animal's sheer size helps conserve heat, suggests the dinosaurs could have had warm bodies and therefore could have had active lifestyles, even if they shared the turtle's reptilian metabolic rate. So is it finally settled? Dinosaurs were cold-blooded? Not so fast. Perhaps dinosaurs had some intermediate strategy, a body temperature higher than reptiles, but lower than mammals. Is there some other way to put the hot-blooded, cold-blooded issue to rest? Paleontologist Jack Horner. What we have here is a, a nest of baby duckbill dinosaurs, myosaurs, and an adult. And our problem is how you get from being a hatchling at 16 to 18 inches long up to an animal that's 25 or 30 feet long. We know that if we were to compare them to modern crocodiles or alligators, um, these kinds of animals grow about a foot a year. So if the dinosaurs grew like a fast reptile, they'd hatch out at 16 to 18 inches long, it would take them 20 years to get up to the size of an adult. Well, as it turns out, we have a way of determining how long it actually took, and that is by looking at the internal structure of the, of the bone itself. A series of femur bones belonging to several myosaurs from baby to adult gives Horner an almost direct look at a growing dinosaur. His pioneering work in bone histology, the microscopic analysis of the fossilized bone tissue, has brought surprising new facts to light. You can tell a great deal about dinosaur growth and metabolism by, by looking at the actual structure of the inside of the bone. And what we have right here is, is a thin section of the femur of a turtle. This is the exterior of the bone here. Uh, these little black areas are osteocytes. And what we're interested in are vascular canals, the, the actual spaces in which the vessels ran through the bone that carried the blood. In this particular case, we're dealing with a, with a relatively slow-growing animal. And we have just a couple of, of vascular canals. If we look at the bone of a turtle, we get a picture of a cold-blooded animal's growth pattern. It's slow. Put the bone of a hot-blooded animal, a bird, under the microscope, and the picture is quite different. Vascular canals run throughout the bone, indicating high metabolism and fast pace of growth, both typical of hot-blooded animals. And now look at a bone from the baby myosaur the vascular canals show up as white. Which does it resemble, turtle or bird? 
as you can see, a dinosaur has dense vascularization, just like we see in birds. In fact, there's actually more vascularization than we see in some of the large birds like ostriches and, and emus and things like that. Now, if we remember this, and now we'll go on to an adult dinosaur, as you can see, there's in the adult bone, there's lots of, lots of these vascular canals where the little white spots are. And what's interesting here is the is this dark line that you see running right down here. And that that is an arrest line. When the animal was younger, it was growing relatively fast, and it was growing and growing and growing. And, and at this particular point, growth slowed down. And like, like us and like a lot of other animals, metabolism slows down. I mean, we do it when we're about 40 years old. And dinosaurs did it as well, but they appear to have done it when they were about four years old. For Horner, the many vascular canals and the thin arrest line settled the dispute. So the bone histology basically tells us that that dinosaurs had relatively high, pretty high metabolism, that they grew really fast, um, and that they were much more like like birds than they were like reptiles and were probably very active animals like birds and and not sluggish like reptiles the final word has not been spoken in this dispute some scientists say horner's myosars may be a special case but many authorities now agree with him and say yes dinosaurs were indeed warm-blooded Migrating dinosaurs, running dinosaurs, dinosaurs as active as birds. All this new information means that our series animator, Dave Alexevich, has to keep revising his ideas in order just to keep up. For help with his stegosaur, he goes to Bob Bakker. This is the original mount from about 1920 and is still a darn good mount. You won't find another dinosaur with armor plates as big as a stegosaurus. Latticeps, it's great armor, and it could wiggle. Those plates could wiggle. You mean those plates could move? Yeah, yeah, look at the way they're set in the body, just by their bottom edge, a thin edge. Just a little tug of the skin muscle, and that thing's, the thing's flipping right to left. That was a scare predator. In fact, this whole animal is incredibly flexible from, from nose to, to the hips. There's no stiffening anywhere in the torso. There's no stiffening in the shoulder. That body could twist from side to side and turn itself into a U-turn. I mean, this is Mesozoic uh, martial arts with a lot of choreography. And the reason, the reason for all this choreography is at the tail end are the four uh, anti-predator spikes. Really, really sharp. Great design. Super to draw. Super to animate, I'd bet.
dinosaurs that followed Stegosaurus, such as Triceratops, had totally different approaches to offense and defense. Triceratops, a aggressive, charging, counterattack way of dealing with a big predator. Even though it's a plant eater, the thigh is gigantic. This is twice the girth, twice the strength of a of an African elephant, and the shin of those short has a massive calf muscle for pushing the animal forward in a charge and a counterattack. The front leg is massive, very powerfully muscled. The shoulder blade has, has power, again, for just driving this animal forward. And if you look under the head, you can see the ball and socket joint where the neck meets the head, just about uh -huh. at the center of gravity so that head can pivot in every yeah. direction. I need to know where that yeah, pivot let me show you that. point. Let me show you that. It's right here, just below the eyes, in between the horns. And the muscles then can switch that head up and down and sideways easily. It's got to do that. Look where the eye sockets are. The eyes face sideways, like a rhino's, so it's scanning the horizon while it's chewing. It sees a predator, it thrusts forwards, and the neck muscles move that head up and away, mm -hmm. up and away, up and away, like a combination giant rhinoceros and Brahma bull. Here is the best reason for all that solid defense, Tyrannosaurus rex. Not every dinosaur was a peaceable grazer. Some ate meat, a lot of meat. And from Bob Bakker, our animator gets a picture of the mechanics of this bone-crushing carnivore. Right here in the power plant, we should see a gigantic set of lungs and a gigantic heart. And what, in fact, we have is this enormous spread of ribs encompassing the heart cavity and the lung cavity. This isn't the power plant of a, a, a lizard of 7,000 pounds. This is the power plant of an eagle-like predator that could run and fight and kill hour after hour without fatigue. These teeth are unusual. They're strange. They're not sharp, but like, like great steel railroad spikes for jamming into tendon and bone and spine splintering backbones and killing with one tremendous crunch. So I envision a, a hunt of, of T-Rex. Let's say this young female with chicks to feed. She's out searching with those, those forwardly facing eyes, searching the landscape for a triceratops she can cut out from the herd. have been taken to heart by the world's museums. Here in Toronto, Canada, they're building a dinosaur exhibit for the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Peter May builds dinosaurs for a living. In the past, mounting a fossil
colossal skeleton of solid rock 50 feet straight up in the air would have been a tricky balancing act. Let's get the humerus and see how that looks. Check the articulation on that. But now, using lightweight plastic casts, copies of the original bones, the Titan becomes almost a featherweight. Yeah, we do. If we put the original animal up here, it would uh, weigh probably well over a ton. And the animal that we've got is going to weigh probably three, 400 pounds. It's going to be a very dynamic pose. And we have a pile of scientists come up today from the American Museum of New York, and it's their first look at it. It's going to be our first look at it. And it's going to look pretty good. Well, I... Oh, you don't think so? Well, yeah, it, I'm worried... Jack McIntosh is perhaps the world's leading sauropod expert. The thing is, the sternal plates that... You got it. The sternal plates that, that Dan has out at Dinosaur National Monument, which are in place, have th this much space between them. They're the problem they're here not. is the exact relationship uh, between breastbone, okay. shoulder, the and ribs. One. What it'll do... This will dictate our ribs. Exactly. Uh, that's how we're going to work it. Okay. Because it, yeah, the up there is yeah. it so distorted. It isn't the possible vertebrae. that these come down a bit further, is it? Right there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you can see what That seems to be an articulation, right? Right here. Okay, all right, fine. Good. And this, this may have been connected in life, because I mean, this is sure. definitely a cardioid sure. surface. Sure, sure, so. sure. Okay, I, that looks good to me. In December 1991, the new construction opened in New York City at the American Museum of Natural History. Paleontologist Mark Norell. Well, when we decided to put them out together, we wanted to have something that represented some of the new thoughts about dinosaurs, as opposed to the way mounts have traditionally been made. What visitors see is a slice in time from about 150 million years ago. A mother barasaur rears up on the huge pillars of her hind legs to defend the baby crouched behind her tail. The threat comes from an allosaur, a meat-eating dinosaur with razor-sharp fangs. The barasaur has only its huge bulk and the small front legs for weapons. Savage claws and speed favor the allosaur. I think that it represents something very dynamic, and it really gets the idea across that dinosaurs were living animals that had very active lifestyles, very much like modern living animals do. The mount itself has been the subject of considerable debate. Is this true science? How much did barasaurs care about their young? And even if they wanted to protect them, could they have done it like this? Rearing up on their hind legs? So of course the fossils don't tell us that they could actually do this, but they don't tell us they couldn't do it either. So what this represents is something just speculative, something to capture your imagination. Here at the museum, science and imagination have merged. Science needs imagination. It is more than a matter of putting bones together like so many tinker toys. This exhibit could have been assembled only by a coalition of science, informed guesswork, and creativity. That creativity has been pushed to its limits in recent years, as scientists have used every weapon in their armory to pierce the most intimate secrets of the dinosaur's life. and how 
they died. Tomorrow night on the Dinosaurs. I knew that if we were going to tell the story of the origin of dinosaurs, we had to come here. We can look at his jaws and imagine the great gulps of flesh it could have taken from the thigh of Desmatosuchus, whatever. And what's striking about the fossils we find here is the incredible low diversity of species. And I thought to myself, something's here. And Bob picked up a little dentary with teeth in it, and he looked at it, and he, his mouth fell open, and he said, you're right, Jack, this is a baby dinosaur. The Dinosaurs was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the financial support of viewers like you. As an additional service of this station, the Dinosaurs series is available from PBS Home Video. To order by credit card, call 1-800-PLAY-PBS. This is PBS.
forget. All my life, I've told things about myself that would make a baboon blush blue. <laughs> Tony Award winner Robert Morse brings us an uproarious two days in the life of Truman Capote. I was always an object of desire. <laughs> yes, I was. Truth, next on American Playhouse. Stick around. <laughs> the presentation of American Playhouse is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the financial support of viewers like you, the National Endowment for the Arts, and by the Chubb Group of Insurance Companies, for over 100 years, providing business and personal insurance worldwide through independent agents and brokers.